So the problem I'm having is there's something with the network here that isn't letting my virtual machine make it accessible to itself or something. I've never had this problem before, and I travel a lot. So needless to say, I'm not going to have like an actual live website with you know, a representation of the code. We're going to get to go through VI and actually look at the code on black and white text. So we're going to go uh, old school. <laughs> and you'll have to envision the pretty website that I had made that really wasn't all that great to begin with. So anyway, I'm Jeremy Brown, and uh, this is my presentation. If you have any questions, I like to just have them as we go, that we don't have to wait until the end and everybody forgets what it was about and all that kind of stuff. So just raise a hand, shout out, that kind of thing. Uh, there are a bunch of Zen Framework and PHP buttons somewhere floating around in the big giant bag. Uh, uh, Kevin from Zen brought those, so help yourself. Okay. <laughs> And we'll blow through a few of these first slides that is here for uh, Okay, there we go. This is wonderful. Yeah. Zen certified engineer, I've been coding PHP since 1999, so way back in the day with PHP 3. I've been using Zen Framework uh, since uh, 2008. So that's a few things about me in case you're wondering why it is I'm standing up here talking and you're all in here listening to me. And I'm an all around cool guy. <laughs> Tried to add a few jokes because I know it's early. And the way this is going, I'm glad I did. <laughs> All right, so a couple ways you can contact me afterwards. Um, I have a blog at notmessenger.com, that's my screen name. You're going to find that at Twitter. You can also email me. I hang out in the ZF Talk in the Dallas PHP uh, rooms on IRC. I go to the Dallas PHP user groups, and a lot of people know me. So that's that. But just letting you know. And now we're done with the boring stuff. Let's talk a little bit about this presentation real quick. Uh, all the slides, the code examples, if I can get them back. <laughs> and a video recording of this will actually be on my blog at notmessenger.com slash presentations. So after all of this, you can go back and look at them and that type of thing. I would also appreciate if you could, after the uh, presentation, and this is for Chris Bernard, if he's in the audience at all. Chris? No. Ah, oh, this is for him. He hates laser pointers. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so our very own Chris Bernard over here in the corner has written this wonderful site called Joined In, and it's a way for uh, audience members to provide feedback to the presenters after the presentation, so that they can go back, figure out how to improve, that kind of thing. Feel free to write, hey, you have a presentation that works. That'd be great. And I will make sure it does next time. So you go to this URL, joinin.talk, or excuse me, join.in slash talk view 1782, and that goes specifically to this presentation. And I know Chris has added uh, links for all the other presenters' uh, sessions as well. So if you'd be so kind throughout the day, this is my little public service announcement, to go to that site, fill all that out. The presenters definitely appreciate it. I know Chris appreciates it, et cetera. Any questions? So we're going to blow through this stuff because the other stuff will take a little bit longer. All right, so a couple of questions for you guys. All right, how many of you have played with or used Zen Framework before? Okay, pretty decent number. So this next question then is, uh, how many of you have heard of it? I'm assuming the same number or maybe a few more. And at this point, how many of you are realizing you're in the wrong session? It's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> there are several more quality sessions across the hall if you would like to uh, take this opportunity to get up and go join them. It will not hurt my feelings, I promise. <laughs> you have to sit down. <laughs> well, no. You're my shill. You cannot wish. <laughs> I think that works. Oh, okay. I'm going to try going back and forth. Okay. Okay, so what we're here to talk about is how can you use Zen Framework without having to adopt a full MVC stack? Uh, I've worked for several different companies and several different projects, and a lot of them have involved integrating Zen Framework, wanting to move to Zen Framework, and this talk came out of some of the misconceptions, some of the problems that existed uh, as far as, you know, how can I take advantage of Zen Framework when I have this existing website that's been around for five, six years, you know, 30 years, you know, whatever crazy map people throw out there. I've got new functionality that I've got to continue to roll out. I've got developers I need to train, you know, et cetera. So that's what this is all about. So it's broken into four uh, sections or four tips or whatever you want to call it. So the first one, if I were to register. Okay. Thank you, though. So the first one is the absolute easiest way you can integrate Zen Framework functionality into your existing code base and your existing website. Zen Framework is designed 
with this concept of use at will architecture. So it has loosely coupled components that have minimal dependencies. So if you're looking through the Zen framework manual, and you're looking through the code base, and you find some Zen components that you want to use, like Zen mail, or Zen date, or currency, or, you know, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of these modules. I forgot to turn that off. Gee, whiz. Stand by for one moment. Jason, I never want to go first again. I would just like to put that out there. <laughs> Sorry about that. I meant to turn this off and got distracted by all the other things. Give me just a moment. Where is it now? That's not it. I'm going to go back here. To... Okay, I'll pass up. I actually did that here. Here's the worst. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, yeah, they, they work. I just hit the wrong button. I am looking for. Where the heck is it at? Okay, where do I tell it to not shut off? Oh, that's top of the screen saver. There we go. Sorry. Okay, now I'm waiting for the little colored wheel. Yeah, I'm going to turn my power settings. It's not the screen saver. Well, it is the library. Would anybody else like to see something go wrong? If you have any ideas, suggestions, I'll see what I can pull off. The microphone. Man. Uh, I, I'm waiting on the little colored wheel. It's now my computer decides it's late. Uh, all right, well, while I was doing that, let me see if I can go back to this. I'll just keep whipping the mouse and I'll come back to that. Okay, this is a comedy of errors. All right, so user will architecture. So if you find some components, again, like Zenday, Currency, you know, any of these other ones that you want to use, you have the ability to pull in just that module and use it in your code. You don't have to go to this MVC stack, which we'll talk about what MVC is here in a little bit, so don't worry if you don't know what that term is yet. You don't have to rewrite anything. You don't have to you know, take the overhead of Zen framework. You don't have to deal with configurations. You truly can just say, hey, I want to use Zen Mail so I can send binary attachments and multi-part emails. I'm going to include Zen Mail and I'm going to use it. And it's as simple as that. So, yes sir? That makes it sound more like a library than a framework. Though. Yes, Zen Framework is, is both. Um, there are some PHP frameworks that exist that are truly frameworks. It's, it's use it or don't use it. And it's very hard to, to pick and choose. And Zen Framework was designed with this at its core, this design philosophy of let's make this a use it will architecture. So that way you can use it as a library, but if you want to fully, I'm apparently hit the mouse, if you want to fully take advantage of an MVC stack, you also have that ability as well. And that's what leads to this ability to do this gentle migration, I don't know call it. Um, I don't have anything else to say about that. <laughs> All right, so this is where we would have went to a website, and what you would have seen is a website that would have come up, and I'll explain it to you, and then we'll look at the code so it makes sense. And it had a text box, and it was currency converted. That was the module we were going to demo, and we're still going to look at in the actual code. So it had a text box, and you type in any dollar amount that you want, you know, $2. And then you're going to be able to pick, I want to see this. So you type in a number two, rather. And you say, I want to see this formatted as US currency or uh, British currency. If you pick US currency, you're going to get the dollar sign and the number two, and then a decimal point and two zeros after it. And if you picked, uh, uh, the uh, Great Britain currency, you can see a pound sign with a two, and a space and two zeros. So that's what visually you would see on the screen. So I'll show you the code that uh, makes that. Let me switch my display. That's the wrong window. Okay. Let's see if we can make this easier to see. Well, this is going to have to do. We'll adjust it as we go. My apologies for having to see it like this. All right, so. Oops, oops, oops. That watchdog that is looking for my internet connection is going to cause us problems. All right, so here's the code. 
So let me scroll down a little bit here so we can see it. All right, so the idea is it was a self-contained form. So you had a form, you hit the submit button, it posts back to itself. So what you're seeing, and this is why laser pointer are definitely going to be handy. Can everybody read that? I'm not sure, unfortunately, if there's a whole lot I can do about that. Lockdown, maybe? Do what? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure where the switch is at. Does it, anybody see the switch back there? Switch the Try it, see what happens. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> the other way. I probably hit a few more, see what happens. That's the mystery switch. You get a nickel to figure out what huh. you can do. Well, this is one those are the sides. Okay. Well, hmm. I'll see if I can figure something out here in a moment. We will take a short intermission after this one, so I can figure something out. So basically, this is an example of the code you might possibly have already in your code base. So we have a switch statement. This is okay. I want to look at the value of the locale variable that's coming in from my drop down. English, French, Spanish, you know, how do I want to see my currency? So we've got a switch statement. And we've got some cases. Oh, this is my US currency that I want to see, and maybe my formatted currency value is going to be equal to a dollar sign with a space, and then maybe I'm going to run the value that they typed into the, the uh, input box to the number format because that's going to give me my two decimal places over here to give me my US conversion. Then I'm going to have another uh, case statement in my switch statement that says, okay, if I want to see this in uh, you know, Great Britain, British format, then I'm going to output this HTML entity, which will render this nice little pound sign on the screen. Then I'm going to give this a number format, and then I'm going to give it some optional parameters down here that tells it, hey, format this as if it was the English Great Britain uh, format. So again, you know, this is the type of code that you might have lying around in one of your projects right now. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is how we you know, used to write code. How else are you going to do it? You know, now maybe this calls off to a function, or maybe you wrote a class, or some other library, but at the core of what you're doing, you're just making these decisions. You've got a decision tree you're going through, and you're outputting your results. And it works. There's nothing wrong with this. But maybe you're looking at what Zen Currency can offer as far as functionality, and you're going, you know, if I want to implement any of that type of stuff into this code base, I'm going to have to A, write it myself, B, I'm going to have to start changing things, then I'm going to have to rerun my test, because we know everybody has unit tests, right? <laughs> so, you know, how do I use Zen Currency to replace this? And that's what the next code example is going to show us. Okay. So, we want to use Zen Currency. And we'll get into how you use it, like how you actually include it for use in a moment. But you'll notice that right here, we create a Zen currency object. And we pass in, you know, that 1, the 2, the 15, you know, whatever it is, that value that we want to uh, display in different currency formats. So we have a currency variable, set it to a new instantiation of the Zen currency object. And then we're just echoing it out to the screen. And then we're saying, we're calling the two currency method of this object. And we are telling it what we want to uh, output. So let me back up a second. When we instantiate the Zen currency object, we actually pass in the locale. So I want to create a Zen currency object that's going to be in the US English locale, or the Great Britain or United Kingdom English locale, or the French locale. Once it has that locale information inside the object, anytime I say I want to convert my echo out to currency, it's automatically going to do all the formatting for you. So we replace that switch statement with one line to instantiate our object, and another line to just use the code. Now you have everything Zen Currency has to offer. And there's a bunch of stuff, and I'm not going into it, because this isn't about Zen Currency, it's just to show an example. But if this is Zen Mail, you have the ability to add subjects and attachments and, and encode it, and you know, mail transports. If it was uh, the uh, Zen Date, you can add dates, subtract dates, uh, format them different ways. You can add weeks. You, can, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things you can do. And here it is in two lines. So, how can we get these two lines to actually work inside of our project? Well, to Mike's point, I'm sitting over here in the corner, Zen Framework, when it's being used like this, is very much like a library. So like any library, you need to tell it where to find the library, and then call the code, which we've already talked about. Zen Framework works best, and you can argue basically the only way it will work for you without a lot of problems, is if you put its location on the include path. Because it does a lot of auto-loading internally 
And without it being on the include path, that autoloading is not going to work for you, and you're going to have a whole world of headaches. So what I've done here is I created a variable that just has a path to my Zen framework installation, which in this case, you know, user local share Zen, Zen framework 1.10.6 slash library, which happens to be the latest version that's out right now. And that's just so I can reuse it multiple times. So I'm going to set my include path. I'm going to put a Zen framework on it, and then I'm going to add the rest of my include path. So I'm just adding it to my include path. Nothing, you know, nothing fancy there. And all these code examples can be available on my website, notmessenger.com, so that we don't have to worry about writing all this down. I'll put all of them up there. Then I need to pull in the Zen Framework autoloader. So that way it can handle all of the autoloading for us. So I'm going to require once the autoloader file. We have a whole conversation about you know, requires and includes and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, somewhere in your code, you're going to have at least one require once or include once if you're doing any sort of abstracted coding or anything that's using a library. Here it is for our Zen framework usage. We are requiring once our autoloader. So we're asking it to go to that path and then grab Zen loader autoloader. And then we're using a static instantiation of it to return an instance of the autoloader. So once we put Zen framework on our include path, we've instantiated the Zen framework autoloader, we are now free to instantiate any Zen module we want with a few exceptions. There's a few modules like Zen View and a few others that are more geared towards the MVC stack that you're not going to want to use individually. It's possible, but you're, if you're going to do that, you'll know why you're doing it. 99% of the modules, your, your currency, your format, your translation, your filters, your validators, I can go on and on and on, can all be used exactly like this. Any question? <laughs> And I wish we would have had a working example. Because if you run this in the browser, you would get the exact same visual output on the web page, but you're using this code instead. Yes, ma'am. Um, we, we, we run PHP 5.2. Okay. Um, hosted in Apache. Mm -hmm. In a Windows Server 2003 server. So I wonder what I need to do to be able to use Zen framework. Put Zen Framework somewhere on your system. Uh -huh. it, I, it doesn't matter where, just put it somewhere on the server. Okay. Add it to your include path. Okay. And that's it. Oh, that's it. Instantiate your auto loader, so that way all the inside magic of, of calling these objects will work for you. Uh, I wonder what I need to do to be equivalent to this. You'll stand there. Uh, instantiate the, the, the loader. And yes. Then, uh, and do I, I mean, do I have to put that in code? Yes, if you are, and the next section we're going to get to is how do you do this if you already have an autoloader of your own. But if you do not have an autoloader of your own, if you have just single pages or maybe you have some loosely coupled pages that are, you know, they have a few functions, they have a few classes here and there, but it's, it's nothing too complicated, then this is how you would do it, and you let this autoloader take care of loading your, your modules for you. So when you say you said currency, what's happening is... The autoloader sees this and says, oh, I really need to go to user local share Zen, Zen framework, blah, 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 slash library, slash Zen folder, slash currency, call the currency.php object that's called Zen underscore currency, instantiate an object of, of it, and return an instance. It takes care of all that stuff for you. So you can just say, I want to use Zen currency. And you don't have to worry about, that's really annoying. Uh, you don't have to worry about all of those mechanics. It just does it for you. So, add it to your include path, instantiate the autoloader, and start using it. Yes, sir? What is the Zen loader autoloader doing there that, that register autoloader wouldn't do? I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> um, I don't have it all memorized. Okay. There's, and I'm more happy to pull it up right here at the end and we can go over it because I do think it's a fair question. Um, there's a section in the manual that talks about it. There's a few. Trying to think of the right wording. I, I, I don't want to misspeak. I remember reading the paragraph and going, oh, okay, yeah. And, and of course, now I'm drawing a blank. It, it does a few things that the, the auto loader or the register auto loader doesn't do. It, it fixes a few things that Zen Framework needs. A few of them are performance, a few of them are some other things. I'm absolutely more than happy to pull it up because uh, there is a section like right at the beginning of the Zen loader 
manual that says, hey, we use this because it answers your exact question. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer in front of me. I believe the autoloader process is one of the areas that's going to get overhauled in the next version of the framework. I believe so also, yes. Yeah, Zen Framework 2.0 is being worked on. Uh, there's no release date. Yeah, I mean, probably within a year is safe to say it'll be out. It's not going to be out next week. I know they're working really hard on it. Um, it's going to, it, this kind of stuff is going to change. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe this is slightly different here in how the autoloader gets registered, but it's going to be a minor tweak. The concept is still the same. So nothing you're learning here today, you're going to have to go, oh my gosh, 2.0 is out, now what? This is going to work the same way from what I've seen so far. If anything, it'll get easier. Yeah, exactly. Because they're aware that people want to be able to use it like this, as well as using the full MVC stack. Any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> so, let's go back and oh, I'm switch back to my display. I did not mean to click that. All right. And play. Okay, so, recap. So you can use, easily use any Zen module as needed. And again, there's a few caveats. Uh, you know, if you get into Zen views, Zen layout, uh, a few of the ones that are, are designed for the full MVC stack, I mean, you're going to know that you, if you're starting to use those, you're doing it for a specific reason. But otherwise, Zen view by itself is really good for creating email. Yes, very true. Yes, absolutely. Oh, All right. You simply add Zen framework to your input path. And Zen Loader Autoloader will do all the rest of the work for you. And just because I planned on it. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you. I thought of that three years ago. I know, right? This is, it couldn't have gone, gone any worse. I probably shouldn't say that because <laughs> so far my Mac is still on. All right. <laughs> All right, so the next section then is how do we add new functionality to an existing code base? And more specifically to this is what if you have a slightly more involved code base where you're using your own autoloaders? Because we just talked about how can I use a Zen framework autoloader to do this for me, but what if you already have a site set up that's using an autoloader? How can you get the two to play nicely together, or can you? All right, so then, and that kind of leads into this next question, is how does it play with existing autoloaders? And the answer is, nicely. And that's it, I mean, it, it's nice, it's better than horribly, right? I mean, it's, it's that easy. All right, so, we would have had a nice, another little nice uh, web page here for you to see, but I'll describe it to you. <laughs> as soon as I switch over here, let me uh, switch back to this. And go back here. All right, so let's do two See, so we have a range of different folders, and they're so nice. All right. So, you're going to have a web page, and it was just showing you know, some simple pages, and et cetera. And we're going to go look at the code, which I'm going to pull up. You're going to be able to see that you're using our own custom autoloader to be able to load up this functionality. So let me load. OK, so this is a web page, and it is going to instantiate a user object, and it's going to populate that user object with some names, and then it's going to echo them out on the screen. So, um, you know, we're stationing a new user object, we're setting the first name, we're setting the last name, and then we're echoing out those values here. So we have a method called get full name that's putting these together, you know. So it's real simple. It's just, hey, you're on a page and it says, welcome, Jeremy Brown, because that's my name. Hey, we go look at the code, here you are. So, you know, this is an existing code base. You have, in this example, your own custom autoloader that you've written for your company, your project, you know, whatever. You've got all this logic already in place that's allowing you to simply just call a new user and have it a or return an instantiated instance of your user object for you by utilizing this pre-written and custom-written 
auto load. So now let's go look at that file so we can see what it's doing. All right. So in here, we're using the magic method of auto load. So now we're getting in some of PHP's built in uh, auto loading capabilities. And we're simply, and we cut this example very, very simple because we could spend an entire session on auto loading. <laughs> we are including once this file, or this path, excuse me, slash library, and then the class name. So remember on the other screen, which I wish I could switch back to, but unfortunately I cannot, we were saying require once. Um, and then we were saying, uh, we were requiring, I forget the name of the file, unfortunately, but whatever that name was, what's happening is it's getting passed in here, and it's going to this path slash library, and then the class name. And that's how it can find it, because this is our custom written auto loader that already is in existence in our code base. So does that all make sense so far? No. Any <laughs> question? <laughs> so, where, how does, where does auto load be called? So, this is a magic function inside of PHP. Yeah, that was, yeah. So it's magic. It's magic. <laughs> it's a lot of this. <laughs> and then you get it by the underscore, underscore, at the end. Exactly. So, the database magic? The what? You're not talking about taking database public. No, 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 no. Uh, there's, a, there's a series of functions within PHP that are considered magic functions that just do things for you automatically if you set them up to do that. So this is one of those. All right, so that is those two files. And then you see here we've got the library. So if we were to look inside the library folder, there's our user. There we go. Remember I said new user. So it knows, oh, if I'm asking for a new user, then I'm going to go to, in my other code, I said new user. The auto loader takes care of it and says, oh, where's my path? My document root slash uh, library user instantiates the object and returns an instance of it. So there's our pre written auto loader. Now, um, let's look at this file. I'm thinking when you said you're going to have like a clash of magic. Like the, yes, you do. The dark magic and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I'm looking for my. Okay, so this is that same code example. New user, set the username, get the username, etc. Exact same code, but I wanted to add using Zen currency at the bottom of it. I'm like, hey, I come along, I'm going to use the tips I learned from my last piece, and I want to you know, use Zen currency. So I instantiate my Zen you know, currency uh, object, pass in, and in this case, I'm actually doing it uh, with an array, a set of array parameters. You know, again, it's versatile. So I set my locale, my value, none of that's really important. I'm echoing this out. And if you ran this in the browser, you're going to see a series of errors. Because this will not work. Because as Mike just said, if you're trying to use this, it's going to conflict with your other autoloader. Because when you call this, it's going to look for Zen currency on your existing autoloader path because your autoloader is the one that's in control. And it's going to get all kinds of failure. So the next code example we're going to look at is how can you resolve this? All right. So I've resolved it by replacing the file, and that's all you have to do. <laughs> We're going to go look at that file. But all I had to do in this code, in user land, was just swap out my autoloaders. Now you can obviously take your existing file and modify it. In this case, I want to keep them separate so you can see the before and the after. But all I did is give it a different autoloader. And we're going to go look at what that code's doing to make all this work. So the user land code is still the same down here. All the same code. So what does that user land code, or excuse me, what does that new autoloader look like? All right. Remember before, we had our autoload function. And then we said include blah, 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 slash library, and it went and grabbed it. Well, we still have that, but we modified it a little bit. 
So we're adding Zen Framework to our include path. Because remember, we just talked about in the previous tip, Zen Framework needs to be on the include path for all of its own auto-loading to work. We still have our auto-load magic method. But now what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, the file that you are expecting to load auto-magically, first check and see if it exists in our library. So see if it's one of our files compared to whether or not it's a Zen Framework file. If it exists, continue doing what you did before, which is include the, doc, the server document root slash library in the name of that file, and everything is fine. If the file doesn't exist, then I don't want to serve it through my own auto-loading code out of my own library. I instead want to hand it off to Zen Framework, at which point, and this should look very familiar, I'm going to require it once my auto-loader, and I'm going to create a, uh, an instance of it. In this case, I'm actually going to assign it to a variable. So that way I can actually, oh no, I'm sorry, that was something else. Ignore that. It doesn't matter if it's there or not. Once I've created an instance of the Zen loader, auto loader, I'm then going to call a static class of load class, and I'm going to tell it which one I'm looking for. So this line right here is a little different than the last example, because the last example, I only had to register my auto loader here, and I stopped. But now, since I specifically want to load a class, I call the load class. And this will allow both sets of autoloaders to work. It will start off with your library if the file exists, and it will fall back to Zen Framework if it doesn't. And that will allow you to have your own custom library side by side with any of the Zen Framework models. Are you going to end up instantiating multiple uh, Zen loader autoloader instances if you call it multiple times with multiple classes? Excellent question. This will take care of it itself. It maintains a singleton instance, like inside. Oh, it, just, it just understands. Okay. Yeah, it understands. But you bring up a very good point. Any code you have in here, like if you were setting variables or talking to session or whatever, this is going to be called maybe several times throughout the single execution of your script. So do be careful what you're doing in here, um, because you can start, you know, having some memory growth, you know, that type of thing. Because if you're calling, if you're auto loading ten classes in the single execution of a single script, this file is going to get called 10 times. <clears throat> yes, sir. Hey, if you're using the, uh, if you're already using the SPL autoloader, like, could you uh, just add Zen to that SPL autoloader? Would that work? I have never tried that. I have seen examples of it. I have not done it myself. I, just, I know if it Yeah, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I don't know. I think that Zen loader auto loader actually uses the SPL. Uses the SPL, so, so it may very well. It's easy enough to check. And it might be easier just to do it this way so that way you don't have to. And that, that is precisely one of the reasons why in the next version of the framework they're reworking the auto loading mechanism is to incorporate the SPL to a greater degree. Any other questions? I wonder, I wonder if Auto loader is a way to dynamically change your include past. You can, sure. I mean, you can put more logic in here, and you can put in a switch statement or something and say if it's this class or if it's that, and change the locations of it. I mean, you definitely could. But I wonder why do I need to use auto loader if I put everything inside the include path, Why do I still need to? Your own auto loader or Zen Frameworks auto loader? I, I never use auto loader before. Right. So my question is, why do I need it? Okay, if you, if you don't have an auto loader in your class at all, or excuse me, in your existing code base, then this tip isn't for you. The previous tip is. You would still want to use the Zen Framework auto loader, because what happens is when you call Zen Currency, Zen Currency has a bunch of dependencies that it takes care of itself, and it's going to load, uh, and I don't have them all, and I'm probably screwing up a few, so don't hold me to it, but it's going to call like Zen Locale, and Zen Filter, and Zen Validate. There's all kinds of things it's going to use, depending on what method you call. It needs to know how to find them all by itself for you. So unless you want to require once all kinds of files so it knows where to get them, the auto loader takes care of that. So when it calls Zen validate, it knows where to go find it. So it still needs its own auto loader. That's being tweaked in, two, in version 2, because there's some discussions about how much of that it should do versus not. And you know, if you're really trying to tweak some performance, auto loaders, you know, kind of bog you down a little bit, and, you know. Actually, auto loaders uh, increase performance in your application, typically. 
Yeah, I, I, did a, I, I would tend to agree with that. I've seen a few times where it doesn't, but I would agree. I did a test on Zen Framework a while back that uh, uh, stripped all the requirements out of it and used the autoloader alone, and it gave me 20% improvement in performance. Yeah. yeah. So you're not going to be able, well, okay, with very minimal effort, you're not going to be able to get away from using the Zen Framework autoloader. You can make it happen, but you you got better things to do. <laughs> You're not going to want to do that. You saw the question? I was going to ask what the performance was of that. Oh, 20% I hear. <laughs> <laughs> All Any other questions? OK, let's flip this back. No, I do not. All right, so recap. You can continue to use your own autoloader. Zen Framework's autoloader can also be used, and the result is you can easily add new functionality implementing Zen Framework code into your existing code base. And now that, that was easy. Was easy. <laughs> Easier than the first one. I'm getting better at including my way through this. <laughs> All right. So, the third tip. So, we're halfway through the tips. There's four. Can we just recap the sure. auto loader thing? Yes. Just summarize it. When, like, I'm using Symphony, and it has its auto loader, and I'm trying to put Zen Framework in there, and it's got its auto loader. What's best practice? Use Zen Framework. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, wish life was like that. Um, you know, I I probably should have done a fifth tip on how to integrate two frameworks together. I, I don't. Have, but I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, I don't have an answer. I thought that's what you were trying to get to by showing. You. No, it's more of how can I use Zen Framework with something I already have when something you already have is not another framework. <laughs> I should have put that in subtext <laughs> in the title. Um, I'm definitely willing to you know, talk about it after Just this. isolate the two frameworks. Yeah, I mean, that's ultimately what you're going to have to do. As long as the autoloaders are, you can, as long as you can get the autoloaders to leave each other alone, and if anybody else has played with this, let me know. I can't imagine you have a whole lot of problems as long as they are, the autoloaders leave each other alone. I have experimented with it, but I know I've stumbled across combining Symphony and Zen Framework in tutorials, in search results. So I know there are some examples out there and there are some people talking about it. Now I will say that I know that uh, Symphony and Zen Framework as framework development teams have talked to each other. Right. And they like what each other is doing. Right. And version 2.0 of Zen Framework, and I'm not sure what version of Symphony, are supposed to be more user friendly towards each other to solve exactly these problems. Yeah. Because there are a lot of people using both libraries because right. there's, you know, there, I don't know what the number is. Let's right. just say there's an 80% overlap. Right. And then there's that 20% that each library is better at. Right. And so there's a lot of Zen Framework and Symphony. Compared to all the other frameworks that are being used in conjunction, there's a lot more Zen Framework and Symphony overlaps than the others. Is and my and the new version of both frameworks. Correct. Are out. supposed to resolve some of these issues. Because as Tim was saying, while it can be done, it's a lot easier in what's coming. But it can be done. I personally have not done it. And I think I should add a section to this presentation for next time. Because, yeah, I think that'd be good. But does, does Symphony use SP, the SPL auto loader? Do you know that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I, I don't know what it's using in the coverage. Yeah. It, if it is, then you should be able to run using Zen Loader auto loader instead of just using Zen Loader in there. But you should be able to run Zen Loader auto loader because it uses SPL as well. So it should work. I have not had the uh, pleasure of attempting it yet. <laughs> okay, so that was, you know, small little libraries, and I say small, I mean it could have been thousands of files, but conceptually it's kind of a small little library, you've got a few things you pull in, you've got some autoloaders, you know, that type of thing. Um, the next two tips, well this tip is a, is a migratory step to the final tip. We're trying to head towards 
eventually saying with our project, one day we will be 100% full MVC using Zen Framework. That's our end goal. This is that intermediary step of, I have existing code, I can't yet go to Zen Framework completely. But what I roll out today, my three month development project for a new feature that just has to make it out the door, how, what can I do to make sure that I can continue to use it as I head towards that end goal with minimal reuse, or excuse me, with minimal rework and refactoring? I don't want to waste my time. I'm a developer, I'm lazy. I don't want to waste my time. So, this section is about exactly that, planning ahead. And unfortunately, as the comic points out, that is usually the case. All great plans. <laughs> All right, so there's this concept of separation of concerns within the development world. It's not just PHP, it's, it's any language. The previous examples we talked about had very little or even no separation of concerns. There was a web page that had HTML that then went into PHP mode, it went and talked to a user class, it did an echo, and it was just all right there. There was no separation of concern. You couldn't very easily reuse the logic, you couldn't change the style easily if you had that 15, 20, or 100 different pages. So there's this programming concept of model view controller, or MVC, and sometimes you see it as MCV, you know, etc. How many people are kind of sort of familiar with the idea of MVC or MCV or whatever implementation? Okay, great. I don't have to spend a lot of time. If you have any questions, please ask. All right. So we're not concerned about view and control in this example. When you are rolling out new functionality and you want to write it in the Zen framework way to save yourself time later, you should be concerning yourself with models. Controllers are just the glue that direct traffic. That's easy to do. The view, that's HTML and CSS, and if you're lucky enough, like I know Jake is, calling him out, you don't have to do design. You hand that off to another team. So it's really not your concern. <laughs> what you need to be concerned with are models. And the reason for that is because models are data and or your business logic. They are what run your application. Sometimes, they might be a direct relationship to a database. Other times, they might just be domain logic. They might talk to a web service. There's a, a very prominent misconception that models equal databases, and that is wrong. They can sometimes equal a database, but they equal data and or business logic. In Zen Framework, models are implemented as objects. Which is good, because objects are our friend, and objects are the future, and Zen Framework is 100% or 99.9% .9 object-based. So, that means that when we start to write our new code, we should be thinking in objects, we should think about separation of concerns, that we should put our business logic in self-contained objects that can later be used as models inside of Zen Framework. Because the full MVC stack in Zen Framework has that separation of concerns with models, views, and controllers. Does that make sense? I mean, I got a bunch of code to confuse you with. All right. So this web page that you would have seen, and so when you're looking through the code, you're wondering you know, what it is that you're looking at. Um, all it did was it, uh, it said, some things had like a couple of pages, and then it showed an example of being able to write something to the database and retrieve it from the database. So even though I just said models are not database, they were the easiest example to be able to instantiate with what I have going. But they could be business logic also. Please remember that. <sighs> Keep doing that. All right. So. So we have this comments page, and what we want to do with this comments page, and again, this is just a real simple example, it's going to, the code is just going to put something in the database, and it's going to turn right back around and read it and show it on the screen. So obviously, you know, anything you do in the real world will probably be a little bit more involved in that, but it was just to show, um, you know, how it works. So, um, we are requiring a comments class. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Is that off the screen for you guys? There. Okay. All right. 
we instantiate a new comments object. We add a comment, calling the add comment method. So now we've added something, so we have some test data. Then all we're doing is we're turning right back around and we're saying, get our comments and for each one, echo them out on the screen. So it's just to illustrate we're writing something and we're reading something. So right here, we have require once classes slash comments.php. And you'll notice, if I scroll up higher, there's no autoloading going on here. This is, we're, we're past the autoloading. We're not talking about that conversation anymore. This is saying, I have a brand new set of functionality I need to add to my existing site. I need to add the comments functionality to my existing website. And it's going to take me two and a half months and five developers, and the fate of the company is resting on our shoulders. How can I write it for future reuse later? I'm writing a comments object, and I happen to just throw it in here, and I'm pulling it in, and I'm instantiating it. And then we're going to go look at what that code actually is and what it does. Okay. Okay, so this is not going to fail the screen the best, unfortunately. This is my comments class that we just talked about. And we have a constructor. So what I'm doing in my constructor is I've decided, you know, the comments class in this example is going to write to a database and read from a database. Well, I don't want to write into my own custom database handlers. I don't want to use MySQL iConnect. I don't want to use uh, you know, PDO SQL, uh, MySQL functions. I don't want to do any of that. In the future, I want to use Zen Framework. And if I want to use Zen Framework in the future, I want to be able to use the Zen Framework library to do it. Well, Zen Framework has ZenDB, which is a great tool. It takes care of the abstractions of your databases for you. So what I'm doing here is a little magic in the front, where I'm going to set Zen Framework on my handling path, you know, we talked about that before. I'm going to require my autoloader, get an instance. I'm doing all of that so I can create a ZenDB adapter PDO MySQL object. So I'm making a connection to my database here. And I'm passing in my parameters, my host name, my password database name. And then I'm setting my fetch mode, which is another option that I can do. So that way when I get my results back, it comes back as objects, because I don't want to deal with arrays or any of that type of stuff. I want objects coming back. So I, when I instantiate this class, I'm loading Zen Framework, I'm creating an instance of the Zen database uh, PDO MySQL adapter, and I'm setting some options on it, and I now have my database. There it is. And why that's important, in just a moment I'll show you. So now I want to add a comment. I can call this method. I pass in a title and a description. I can call this DB, which is my protected member variable that has a reference to my database through ZenDB. Call the insert method, boom, there we go. I just added the data in my database. I want to get some stuff. I'm going to instantiate, or I'm going to use the uh, select method off of the database object. I'm going to build my query. I'm going to return my results. This code right here, of get comments, and this code right here of add comments never needs to be touched when we go to a full Zen Framework MVC stack. This is how you do it in Zen Framework. Now, there's like three or four ways you can do it, and whichever way you pick is fine. Whichever way you pick is what you would put here, and you don't have to touch it because it's just talking to a variable that you instantiated in your constructor. Now, when you go to a full Zen, uh, full Zen Framework MVC stack, we're going to tweak the constructor. We're going to still have an instance of ZenDB on the thisDB member variable, and all of this code will continue to work the same way. You don't have to change any of it. We're going to change six lines of code, and that's it. So you've now rolled out your brand new comment functionality and save the company and got that nickel raise. And when you eventually go to Zen Framework, that's when you make up the difference to say, oh, this is going to take nine months. <laughs> you take a very long vacation, you come back, you change six lines of code and go, here you go, I'm going on vacation. And I'll show you an example of what the converted one looks like. But does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Um. 
if you are adding two new pieces of functionality, mm -hmm. let's say a comment and something else that access the database. Uh -huh. So, and the point is, is that you've got two things that are accessing the database. Right. Then the constructor, could it still be constructed the same way? Yes, you have two choices there. The absolute, well, you can, you can argue easiest, but the absolute easiest way is to let both objects just do their own thing in the constructor. And you'd have the same six lines of code to change in each object. And while that's technically re, you know, extra work, it might be easier in the long run. Zen Framework, if you're using the full stack, you can use the bootstrap process, which then will load Zen application resources, where you can take your database connector and you can store it, and basically using the registry um, pattern, so that way each of these objects can pull it off of it as a service and they can reference it. It has, it has one location that they all reference. If you want to implement something like that on your own, or if you want to try to load Zen registry in with this also to give you that, you can. At the end of the day, I'm okay just changing six lines at the top of every constructor of every class I wrote and not have all that other headache. Not saying it's difficult, but again, I'm lazy. I can get a junior developer to change these six lines. <laughs> Are you establishing two different connections to the database? No. This is what I was wondering how that was working. Well, they won't be simultaneous anyway. Okay, let me back up. Let me back up. I'm sorry, I see what you're asking. So you have two classes that are calling. You know, that's a very good question. I'm not sure if in a separated model like this, if it will self-register Zen registry instance or not. I uh, think it does. Well, you can actually, not in the registry object, but in Zen DB table abstract, I think there's, you can set the default adapter in there. So that when you actually migrate to a full Zen DB, it'll automatically use that. Yeah. So you just set inside of the uh, inside of the. Uh, you know, you method. you might get two connections in theory, but underneath PHP is going to see that you already have one and use it because PHP does that. Okay. Like if you if you try to connect to the same database again using the exact same information, it's going to reuse the existing handle. So, a byproduct of the language will keep it from being a problem. But you, that is correct. If you're calling two objects like this in the same script, it will run that code twice. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, and again, I mean, the great question, because something else I'm thinking of now that we're going, you know, a little bit more advanced into it, you probably going to have to tweak your include path and see if Zen Framework's already on it, or you're going to add it twice. There's a few things you're probably going to want to tweak. Um, I took this from the approach of, you know, let's get the core concepts down. But now I'm thinking about if you really, you know, we're starting to use multiple classes at once, you're going to want to tweak that autoloader, or not the autoloader, but adding it to the include path just a little bit to make sure you're not adding 20 of them to the include path. I mean, it's going to grab the first one, so it's not going to matter, but your include path is going to get humongous. Because if you keep running that same code, well, I'm not hitting it anymore. If you just keep running that same code, you're going to keep adding to the include path. But all minor things that are solved. All right, so let's look at what it looks like then after uh, we have swapped it out. Uh, where is it at here? Comments. Classes. Oh, I tell you. There we go. Okay, so this is what it looks like replaced. Here's our constructor. We still have that same private member variable, this DB. Remember that from before? Exact same thing. Because down here, and we'll be able to show it in a moment, we're still using it. We didn't have to change any of this code that's down here that you're not seeing. But instead of having to include Zen Framework on the, on the include path, register the autoloader, create a Zen DB adapter, PDO, MySQL instance, and pass in a bunch of parameters, et cetera, we're just pulling the default database adapter off of Zen Framework Bootstrap, which is part of the full MVC stack. When you start up an application, you can go through a bootstrapping process, and you can add a database instance to the front controller. So in this case, we're saying, hey, front controller, give me an instance of the, of the uh, ah, you can't quite see it all. Let me, I'll move the screen back and forth for a little bit so you can see it. I would have had this in an editor, and you could have read it better. So we're going to get an instance. We're going to get the parameter off of that instance of our bootstrap 
Off of that bootstrap, we're going to get our plugin resource of the database, and I want to get the default database adapter. That's in the manual. <laughs> I just not memorized, trust me. I'm looking at the hyphen between the DB and the Z control. Is that an equal sign? Yes, this is an equal yeah, sign. Yeah. Correct, yep. And we're statically calling Zen controller front, and we're getting an instance of our bootstrap, grabbing the database plugin resource off of it, and getting the de default database adapter off of that instance. Looks like a hyphen. It does look like a hyphen. It says equal, <laughs> but I agree with you. It looks like a hyphen. There's another line there that clearly is not displaying. <laughs> and then further down in our code, and if I could show these side by side, nothing changed at all. Any questions? Well, I guess one question would be, so would it behoove you to make a base class and then extend that? Yeah, it depends on how, yes, that would be a good suggestion. And if the project was going to be around for a while, you certainly would want to do so. Playing the politics game for a moment, I would want to make it as easy for myself to swap this out later, but hard enough for the management to go, well, man, it's, it's a pain to maintain this. We've got to switch the full Zen Framework MVC stack. Because if you come up with a nice hybrid in-between solution and everything runs fine, welcome to your solution. And you're stuck in limbo, and you're not going either direction. <laughs> so yes, I would certainly write some base classes and make my life a little easier, et cetera. But you, you want this to be a stepping stone that you're not on very long. You want to just keep going. Is there a penalty to I'm sure technically, if you go, you know, literally go through every single byte that's called, yeah, I mean, extending a class is certainly going to add some minuscule amount, but overall, no, it's not really cool. It does not matter. And when you're calling ZenDB, you're extending, I don't know, 30 classes probably. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of them behind the scenes. So even if it did add it, you're one max. <laughs> but no, class extension doesn't add anything. Since I don't know PHP, is it is PHP an interpreter? It is interpreted. Although, yes, it's interpreted. It's absolutely 100% interpreted. There is a hip hop project that came out from Facebook that's open source that will take your code that's, that is intended to be interpreted and it can convert it to compiler code. So you can still write interpretable PHP code but run it as compiled C code. But that's a whole nother tangent. But at the end of the day, it's still interpreted. It's 100% interpreted. Excuse me, if yes. I could invite a number expression or link to the bottom of your Slack. I'm sorry? Um, at the bottom uh, of your screen, let the Slack daemon invite a link or number expression. Right here? Yeah. Oh, no. I'm in VI and I'm about to exit. No, no, no. Uh, I'm oh. talking about your Slack statement. I wonder if that syntax is a number expression or uh, like a link. Is this? Yeah, oh, you're, talk, you're talking about like Microsoft Word. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, I uh, uh, it's, uh, I don't know if somebody can, has a better description of it, but it's... Uh, <coughs> Are we talking about the fluent interface? Yeah, that's exactly what you're talking oh, about. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, yes. Okay, so, yeah. So all, I, can I say all of the Zen Framework modules support the fluent interface? There might be a few floating around that don't. The idea behind it is if I had my select, oh, here, I have my, this DB, I could call my select method, and I do something. Then I could say this DB, and I could say from, and I could do something. I could call all these methods. So let's take email, it's probably easier. Email add subject, email add to, email add BCC, email add from, email, you know, you just keep calling all these methods. The way Zen Framework is written is it implements what's called the fluent interface. So each method returns this, which is a reference to the object itself. So instead of having to say email add subject, email add to, email add from, email add, you know, et cetera, I can say email add to, add from, add subject, and I can just keep chaining my methods together. So at the end of that method call, oh, excuse me, at the end of this method call, I immediately have my arrow, or excuse me, my, my hyphen, <laughs> and it <laughs> has fun. <laughs> Not to be confused with that strangely looking hyphen, it's actually an equal sign. I'm calling my from method, and then I can keep going. This, why there are multiple lines is for my sanity as a developer. You can write it out in one giant line. It's perfectly fine. I prefer to hit return and do some 
tabs, which get converted to four spaces. There's that little tab, four spaces, or, or eight spaces, 13 unicorns, whatever. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. You said it's called a fluent interface, right? Fluent, F-L-U-E-N-T, okay. correct. And you can write it yourself. There's nothing special about it. If you're writing classes, um, like right here, this is my add comment class. I insert, I can say return this. I literally just say return space, dollar sign to this, semicolon. And I will return an instance of this object back to the method. So I could have then said uh, uh, comments, add method, or comments, add comment, retrieve comment. I could have just chained them all together. And that's all it takes to implement a fluent interface. And the advantage there is just easier to write in multiple. Yeah, because you just chain it together. You don't have to keep retyping your, the name of your object and put in the, the, I don't even know what the name is, but the, the hyphen and the greater than sign. It's an arrow. Yeah, an arrow, exactly. I, I'm sure it has some really long, unique Hebrew name. No, but it's only, <laughs> it's only I think that one's, uh, uh, I forgot what it was. Okay. <laughs> We're going to call it the Schroeder. I'll go with that. It's All right. easier to write, it's easier to read. If you're going, if you generate an error inside something that's using a fluid right. interface, right. that can be difficult to handle. Yeah. Zen Framework does it successfully because all of their errors are based on throwing exceptions. Okay. Okay. So from start to finish, they'll throw an exception and their exception capture will apply. If you're writing it into your own code, you have to be careful about that if you're not using it. Like if your return value. Your return value is going to be this, whether it generates an error. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Just like with everything, there's trade-offs. So quick recap, because we're going to, we're going to aim to get this on time when we start late. All right, so write all your new functionality as objects. You will need them when you're inside a Zen framework. A large part of the M in MVC, which is the model, is now already coded, because you wrote all of your new functionality as objects. Objects are your data and or business logic. And now, all you're left with in a page is your view and your controller, because you still have those integrated. That's easy when you go to full stack, you go, oh, what's some logic? I throw that in my controller. What's my view? I throw that in the view script, and so now I'm done. Because 90 plus percent of your application is going to be model heavy. You should be fat model, thin controller. And this heads us in that direction. That was easy. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this next one's going to be, it'd be easier to show with a web page. These we're able to kind of go through. This one's going to be a little bit more interesting. This one is, how can you migrate an existing website to the full MVC, but yet still do the things we just talked about? How can I install the MVC stack and still have my website, uh, my website to work? Jumping feet first, perhaps I should have been head first. <laughs> All right, you never have to stop developing. If you wanted to leave this presentation, go on your production web server, because that's where all the best work is done. You install the set framework. You make sure it's late at night and you've had a few beers. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and take a buddy and you can blame them. If you install Zen Framework, and then you go through and actually install this, uh, you implement the Zen Framework project as a whole, so the full bootstrapping and modules and, and everything, which I'm going to show you an example of. You can actually have that sit side by side with your existing website. It is absolutely possible to have two full-blown solutions sitting side by side. The way you can achieve that is by using the mod rewrite rules and the mod rewrite module of Apache. IIS has equivalents. That's all I'm going to say. It's Microsoft. <laughs> Hire somebody. Does anybody do Microsoft? Like run PHP on Microsoft? You don't count. <laughs> so anyway, IIS can do the exact same things. It's a tad harder, but you can do the exact same things. So what happens in a nutshell is you're going to set up your website. So normally you're going to say, you know, I don't know what the path is, but blah, 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 path to my website slash, you know, let's say HT docs, and that's your root. And you put your index.php, which gets auto-loaded because your package says, hey, look for the index.php and show that first, and I've got my about and the comments for all my pages. Well, what's going to happen is when you install Zen Framework, and I say installed, it's not really an installer per se, but when you create a Zen Framework application, you're going to have an application folder, you're going to have a library folder, a test, docs, a few other things, and you're going to have a public folder. 
the public folder now becomes your new web root. And inside that public folder, there's going to be at minimum two files. Well, there's going to be one file, which is your index.php, and it's now your front control. You might optionally have an HD access file that contains these rewrite rules, or they might be actually in your Apache configuration. It doesn't matter where you put them. The Apache rules are going to write all requests to your website through this one single index.php file that's in your public folder. So if somebody comes to your site and wants to go to images slash icon.jpg, it's going to go there. If they ask for cars.php, it's going to go there, et cetera, et cetera. Everything gets routed. That's the way Zen Framework works. The good thing about this is you can leverage it to convert specific sections of pages at a time. So using your rewrite rules, you can say, I want only these pages to go there, and the rest of them go over there to that folder, um, you know, et cetera. So we're going to look at a quick little example. And again, the example is going to be a little rough simply because it's easier to see it in a, uh, in a web page. But um, we will try to get through this. It keeps moving this. All right, so. All right, so these are my existing pages that were in my site. They're nothing fancy. It says, I'm an about page, I'm a contact page, I'm an index page. There's your website. That's what you have right now on your, on your, you know, on your server, and it's making you guys you know, millions of dollars. There's your website. <laughs> All right, so you want to uh, ins you know, install a Zen Framework application to sit alongside it. So I'm going to pull in One minute. <laughs> I might miss that. I'll talk really fast. So. Okay, so all I'm doing is I already have one pre written that's saving us a bunch of time. All right, so here's our three files from before. Uh, we had index, about, and contact. Let me remove this file. Okay, now we have those new folders I was talking about our application, our data, our docs, our library, our public, and our test. We would then go into our Apache configuration. We would say, uh, and of course, you want to make a change before you go change your Apache. You can tell Apache that your new web group is now public. The moment you do that, these pages about contact and index are no longer accessible because they're not in the web group. So what you do is you move contact into index, or excuse me, into public. Now your contact page is suddenly available. If somebody goes to your domain slash contact.php, it will still come up and load. The only one that's tricky, and this would have been easier with an editor and a website, the only one that's tricky is your index. You already have an index.php file, so you can't just replace it. Because the existing index.php file that's in your public folder does a bunch of Zen Framework stuff. So you can't wipe this one out. So what can you do? For only the index page, you can go into your application folder, go into modules, go into default, and I am more than happy to talk about this afterwards because this gets really into like the way Zen Framework is structured. Remember we talked about models, view, controllers? We have some controllers here. We have an index controller. If I want to do any logic, I can do it in my index action. There's a corresponding view script that I can take the output of what's currently in my index homepage. So basically, I can move any existing file. When it comes to index, I need to take the functionality of my index page, and I need to lay it on top of the index controller and the index view script. I have to convert one page into the full MVC web, and it's only the index.php. All the other files you can leave exactly as they are. Now you can write 100% full Zen Framework MVC functionality alongside your existing site. You can even add new little pages easily to your existing site, and they can sit side by side perfectly with each other. And I wish we could have shown that, and I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. I'll be here all day. Um, where am I at? Let me flip this over and wrap it up. And hit play. There we go. So recap. Rewrite rules make it very easy to convert existing sites to Zen Framework. Existing pages or sections can be migrated to your own case. All the new code can be maintained simultaneously. 
one last time for good measure. And that is it. The presentation will be up here. Please break it. And uh, <laughs> I'm very interested to see your comments. <laughs> like borderline disaster. <laughs> Chris, I wish you 10,000 times better luck than I had. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure everybody knows Dallas PHP meets on the second Tuesday of every month at the offices of Yahoo, right across Central, down Campbell. Uh, you can get information from our website, from the meetup group, or the uh, Internet Relay Talk chat sure. that you mentioned earlier in this presentation. Dallas PHP does it.